thank you. Um, so I also have a research interest in ethics and evidence-based veterinary medicine, but my um, interest is slightly the flip side of what Dr. Ramey has just been presenting to you. Uh, rather than being interested in, in the ethical imperative upon us all to practice evidence-based veterinary medicine, I'm interested in the ethical dilemmas and issues which might face us when we try to do so and as we drive um, ethical-based veterinary medicine forward. And I was interested that the, uh, this um, talks on ethics had been put in this section on alternative medicine because, of course, there are some um, fairly obvious ethical dilemmas that arise in relationship to alternative medicines and lack of evidence and evidence-based veterinary medicine. Um, but I really um, have a much larger question which spans the whole of veterinary medicine, um, and that's to do with what the ethical and societal issues are um, which face us, the issues which Professor Nealon uh, touched upon briefly in her talk just now, um, what the ethical and societal issues are which surround the translation of evidence-based practice from human to veterinary medicine. So um, these are really quite brief presentations and not time really to analyse anything in any detail. So what I wanted to do instead was to give you a flavour of where I think these ethical, ethical dilemmas um, lie and the kind of thing which, along with my co-workers, I'm planning to research for the next few years. We're taking as a starting point, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of days about learning from evidence-based human medicine, and we're taking as our starting point the question of whether um, issues which have already been identified as posing ethical dilemmas in evidence-based human medicine are likely to recur in evidence-based veterinary medicine, or indeed whether we're going to face additional and different ethical issues. And just to give you some idea of the kind of ethical um, problems which have been identified in evidence-based human medicine, um, there's an argument that it can result in defensive medicine. There's an argument which is interesting in relation to what you just said about reducing costs, that in human medicine, actually, it can cause escalating treatment costs because the effort to build data results in you perhaps running uh, more and repeated diagnostic tests. Um, there's an argument that it can limit the ability to innovate, particularly in relation to surgery. Um, and there's a requirement, um, there's an argument that the requirement to generate an evidence base can cause funders of research to concentrate on the areas which they expect to be most lucrative. And when we translate that to veterinary practice, we could say to concentrate on the species which they expect to be most lucrative. One of the things which I'm particularly interested in looking at is whether there are any comparisons to be drawn between implementing evidence-based human medicine in less economically developed countries and implementing evidence-based veterinary medicine in charity models, whether at home or abroad. Um, and I'm very grateful to the Brook charity for the discussions which I've already had with them about this and to their commitment for collaborating on this area going forwards. Just to give you an idea of the kind of problem that we sometimes might come up against, um, you might have a situation in which there's a good evidence base that a particular treatment would be efficacious, um, but it's very difficult to implement that in the local society and the economy in, in which the vet's working. So, for example, you might have a good evidence to suggest that what the horse needs is a week rest, but that's very difficult if the family is dependent upon the horse working for their own well-being. And equally, you might well know that a drug is most efficacious if it's delivered three times daily, but that can be very difficult to do in situations when there simply aren't the trained personnel or enough people available to deliver it. We're interested in looking at the ethics of data gathering, and of course we've heard a lot about data gathering over the last couple of days, um, and uh, the question of whether the quest for data can cause unnecessary harm, and I'll come back to that in a moment. There's a lot of work to be done around the question of consent. Of course, as veterinarians, as opposed to human clinicians, we're dealing with um, patients who can't normally, they don't have the capacity to consent to their own treatment. And so I'm interested in exploring whether the models um, which they use in human medicine when you have patients lacking capacity are in any way or in, an, in any adequate way um, appropriate to veterinary medicine. And also in how we should deal with unowned animals um, and in how we get adequate consent in countries where the whole idea of consent isn't very well developed even in human medicine and where you may, might face additional challenges um, to do with levels of literacy. So, for example, there can be a problem um, in a country if you have a charity working providing animal care and the owners of the animals feel, however wrongly, that in order to get that care, they're, they're effectively being coerced into helping to provide data going back into research. That can cause a problem because that's then not really truly informed voluntary consent. And that has a knock-on issue because it might mean that the research coming out of that is not thought suitable for publication by some of the journals because it hasn't met their own criteria for informed consent and I know that that's something which the veterinary editors have been discussing earlier this year. 
When it comes to um, evidence-based decision-making, um, then I'm interested in looking, as I said, at the question of whether evidence-based veterinary medicine can result in the overuse of diagnostic tests to the detriment of an individual animal, and whether that goes against the ethical principle of non-maleficence, um, it's not in the individual animal's best interest, or whether we could argue um, that it might not be in the individual animal's best interest, but getting a data set is in the interest of a greater number of animals, and therefore that outweighs any harm we're doing to the individual animal. And we'll be using a couple of case studies, equine dermatology and equine reproduction, which is my own area of clinical specialism, um, to investigate that. Another interest of mine from a research point of view is the ethics of animal insurance, and I'm interested to see um, how the insurance status of an animal, whether it's in, uh, insured or not, affects evidence-based decision-making, um, and also to look at how um, pharmaceutical companies subsidised diagnostic testing has an impact on evidence-based um, medicine and decision-making. When it comes to treatment, um, I'm interested in looking at how veterinarians can implement evidence-based veterinary medicine when they're constrained. So they might be constrained either by society or by science or by politics. And just to give you an example of each of those, um, you might have a situation in which evidence exists, but the treatment is declined, and declined by the animal owner. And of course, we're different from human medics because, as I mentioned earlier, we normally have a situation in which the patient is themselves consenting to treatment or declining treatment, or even if they don't have the capacity to consent themselves, for example, um, if they have mental lack of capacity or if they're a child um, whose parents are making the decision on their behalf, then if... As an example, the children's parents declined the treatment which the evidence would support. Human medics always had the option of recourse to law and of going to the courts and trying to get a best interest judgment made. Now, we're in a very different situation because we're looking to the owners to make decisions on behalf of their animals. Um, and providing, because animals legally are classified as owned property, providing that animal welfare law isn't being breached, really it's perfectly within the owner's rights um, to decline treatment however strong the evidence base for it, and that can present dilemmas for us as veterinarians. Another kind of situation we might come across is where there's simply insufficient evidence um, on which to base our evidence-based treatment recommendations, and that's something, again, we've discussed several times, and I'm going to be looking at that particularly in relation to zoo species, for which there tends not to be a lot of evidence, particularly about pharmaceuticals. Um, and then also to look at a situation in which the evidence exists, um, but the veterinarians put in a difficult ethical position because what we know is the best treatment as far as the evidence goes conflicts with policy. So an obvious example to think of that might be where we know we've got a, from the evidence that we've got a vaccine with, which is efficacious in the face of an outbreak of infectious disease, but to use it goes against government policy, which might be based as an example on protecting exports and not wishing to vaccinate for that reason. And then finally, I'm going to be looking at what the ethical impact of evidence-based veterinary medicine is on the position of vets within society. I'm interested in the relationship between evidence-based veterinary medicine and practice management and specialization and scope of practice and particularly disciplinary regulation. And I think that comes back also to the guidelines um, which were being talked about earlier. Um, I'm interested in investigating whether there is a risk that the end result of pursuing evidence-based veterinary medicine will be that there'll be a kind of top-down determination of which vets should perform which procedures, um, and if so, how that will impact on the relationship between animal owners and their local vets, and on the autonomy of the animal owner to decide who treats their animal, and the autonomy of the vet um, to decide who does which procedure, obviously along with the animal owners. So that's quite a whirlwind tour of the kind of issues I think are worth looking at, but I suppose the kind of take-home message to the conference um, if I'm allowed to offer one, is I think all of us, really, whether we're in practice or in academia, um, if evidence-based veterinary medicine is to deliver its potential to improve not only animal health care, but also, of course, human health care via a kind of one health mechanism, all of us, as we go forward, um, need to be developing evidence-based veterinary medicine, both in an ethical context and in the context of the societies in which we're attempting to deliver it. Thank you very much.